Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us at this webinar. Uh, my name is Aravi Kashkaroyan. I am the director of Ari Literature Foundation in Armenia and um, the a consortium of partners from Armenia, Georgia, and Ukraine uh, initiated this project called Visual Stories from Armenia, Georgia, and Ukraine. Our partner in Georgia is Literature Initiative Georgia, and in Ukraine, it's Komora Publishing House. And um, three of us are very happy to uh, provide you with this opportunity of a series of webinars on comic arts and graphic novels. Um, our project, just in short, is about uh, developing the comics field in our countries. And um, also, uh, we are working on three stories, one from each country, uh, written by women writers and uh, to be illustrated, to be made into um, graphic stories by just recently selected uh, comic artists, selected by a competition in each of our countries. And these stories are going to represent women's women's view on war. As you know, three of our countries are also connected by this history, and not only history, but the present of uh, conflicts and wars. Uh, unfortunately, but um, we're going to share the perspective of women writers on uh, on what is actually war for them. Uh, so today our webinar is held by um, Hiddo van Hengel, and uh, I want to shortly present you our lecture. So Higo van Hengel is a writer, historian, and cultural coordinator in the field of comics. He received his PhD in cultural history from the University of Groningen. In 2018, he published a book on visionary and utopian thinkers during the First World War and the interwar periods in Europe. The Sears was translated into Serbian and Croatian in 2020 and published by Cleorso in Belgrade. In 2021, he published The Pack, a collection of reportage about stray dogs and humans in post-war Yugoslavia. It seems like the comic art has always um, reflected on wars and tragedies because as far as I know, the most uh, famous, worldwide famous and important comics are also touching upon this kind of tragedies. It's, it's very interesting and you have also uh reflected on that in your work right mm -hmm. so i'll i'll give the stage to hido now uh yes and some technical uh, details for the participants at the end of the lecture there will be a possibility for questions and you should use the q and a section below in your zoom i hope you can see it and you can write your questions there Depending on the time, if we will have enough time, we will be able to answer all your questions. Otherwise, we're going to select, you know, maybe group the questions and we will ask Hido to answer them for you. As since this is a webinar, you won't be able to ask your questions directly, but we promise to read through all of your questions and um, answer them at possibility. Thank you very much, Hido. The floor is yours, and we're listening to you attentively. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, good to see you, I wanted to say, but that's not possible. But you can see me. I hope you can also hear me very well. Um, apologies for the screen. It's a little bit foggy. I don't know what happened. But as long as you can see the contours of me and maybe hear me, uh, we will have an interesting webinar. Um, I made a presentation also, so I will uh, share my screen. Um, is this also visible for you? Yes, I guess so. Yes, so, yes, it is. It is. Okay, very good. Um, I will take for about 45 minutes, maybe one hour to talk about historical research for comics. Um, um, a little bit. Oh, wait. 
Yes, a little bit about by myself. Um, indeed, I thank you very much, Ari, for inviting me, but also thank you very much for your very nice introduction. Um, originally, I'm a historian, but I'm also a writer and I'm very active in comics. So actually, I'm, I was tremendously happy to uh, in, take this invitation to talk about these three uh, interests of mine. Um, a few things that I've been doing, I always try in my work, in my history and in my writing to find well, to blur the boundaries between, between uh, these three uh, disciplines. For example, I made a newspaper about the First World War where I like collect articles so that people can read it as if it's an, um, a newspaper from uh, the First World War. And um, I'm, my PhD work that I uh, wrote in an academic uh, environment was later also transformed into a... A popular book for a bigger audience and into a graphic novel that I will talk about uh, later. And indeed, I, my latest book was about uh, well, an animal allegory of the wars in former Yugoslavia that I may be talking about uh, a little bit more. But what is very important in my work is that I consider drawing as a tool for social change. And uh, a lot of the projects that I've been engaged in um, is focusing on drawing not only for professionals, but also for amateurs. So I really enjoy bringing people together, elderly people, marginalized people, young people, or even people who have never picked up a pen or a pencil to start drawing together, to do all kinds of drawing exercises, to learn how to express themselves in a non-textual way. And for example, this is a picture of a project that I did in Novi Sad, Serbia last uh, year or 2022 already, where we were like doing this kind of sketch battles where people were drawing um, and then a bigger audience could participate in the topics, choose topics and people could uh, win. But it was not about competition. It was rather about sharing uh, creativity. So this is something that I've I consider very important. Drawing is not only something that results in good books, but also something as a process that brings people together. That was my introduction, and this is my outline. I really want to talk a lot, so there's a lot to talk about. Well, as you can see, this is the outline of my talk. Um, in yellow are the big themes, and the others are, let's say, illustrations of what I want to get across. Uh, history in comics. Well, as I said, I'm a historian and I'm a comics lover, comics writer, comics um, fan. So this is nice to combine. What I will do first is to map the field a little bit. What type of history do we see in comics? How, uh, how can comics be used for history? So rather like showing what is out there and maybe to find out um, what type of genres we can uh, distinguish in the field of history comics. Um, then I would kind of invite you to find your own voice if you're working on comics or if you're contemplating about writing a comic, maybe you can think about how to um, relate to the history you would like to talk about or write about. Then we move on to research. Uh, I, well, I will explain more about the past and the present or the past in the present, well, as some of you may know there's this famous saying the past is never history it's not even past i believe the past is very present and i don't need to explain people in uh, the three countries of yours that history is omnipresent and can be very violent as well so we'll talk about that um then a little bit about my own book the book i wrote with the serbian uh, comics writer it's called the attentat in serbian the assassination um, and since um, I understand that most of you will be writing about war, present war or past war in um, ex-Soviet countries, I think it's also good to think about how comics uh, can um, digest or work on how to cope with uh, troubles, troubled past. And um, that's why I called it comics and tragics, because I think the word comics is too positive and too optimistic to use in the field of uh, war, um, well, <laughs> drawings, I would say. Um, the exercise, I'm not quite sure if we can do that because it's difficult to do interaction also because of the recording, but um, if we can't do, you can still take it as a question home, 
probably you are already home, but you can discuss it later with your friends, your peers, or the persons that you're working with on your historical comic. And of course, there is a Q&A afterwards. So some reflections, questions, please write them down and um, we'll get back to it um, at the very end of my webinar. So um, history in comics, mapping the field. I have been browsing through my um, comics uh, collection and I found a lot. I was, I found really strange stuff. I, I, I really enjoyed digging up the weirdest things. I found Maoist uh, propaganda comics from China. I found um, uh, biographies in, in comics, but also funny adventures, um, educational comics and, and, and journalism. There's a lot out there and history is in French, as they say, a mer à boire for um, um, uh, a mer boire for the for the topics. So you can find a lot to 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 use for writing comics. Um, I think if we uh, if we start with the funny adventures, I think the most famous comics uh, that people in Europe know. Are look the French the Franco Belgian school, so to say. So of course, uh, Tintin, uh, Lucky Luke, and Asterix and Obelix. They're all historical comics in a way. And um, of course, there's a play with history. There's a play with historical facts. But if you really dig deeper in these kind of funny adventures, you see that a lot of research has been done. Lucky Luke, for example, is especially funny and interesting because of the profound research that the makers have made in the history of the well, the the the, the, the early early United States. Um, the history of the Roman Empire has been done well very well for Asterix and Obelix comics, and they're, they're fun to read, they're silly stories, but actually part of them are really based on facts, and this is. Uh, wonderful craftsmanship of the Franco-Belgian schools. And what is especially good in these comics is that they often include a lot of references to our present times. For example, um, an example is Asterix, uh, Asterix when he's visiting the gods, the, the, the Gothic, like let's say the Germans, proto-Germans. Um, you can see very well that this is a comic made by French people just after the Second World War. One of the two makers of Astrid was actually a po Jewish Polish who had to flee, take a refuge from uh, from Europe to the United States. Uh, so you can see that the historical representation of Germans is very negative and very um, well sarcastic uh, about their military behavior and their military nature in the in this comic. I don't know if you've read it, but I recommend it not only to learn more about the distant past, but also about the recent past, the past when this comic was made. In the Netherlands, um, of course, this is a comic not very known outside of the Netherlands, but there was a series of comics um, made in the 80s when I was a kid about the history of the Netherlands, and I really enjoyed it. It has, it was an uh, important uh, first step for me into the world of comics. Um, however, later when I looked back on those comics, I realized it's very um, obvious that this is reinforcing this story of the great Dutch that were um, going all over the world and, and like exploring different uh, alien territories as if the, there was nothing out there. So. I don't say it's a colonialist uh, type of comics, but it's important also to realize that the history as it is represented in these comics um, is uh, up for debate, let's put it like that. Uh, even then, it's a very good comic and very well drawn. So this brings me to uh, a more uh, relevant question about history in comics, because partly it's about history, but it's also about the moment when this comic book was made. And there's always a political undertone in the history comics. Uh, for example, well, in the uh, Martin Luther King book, uh, this little comic book from about the life of Martin Luther King was very influential and very important in the um, 
in in well in the black movements of the past in the in the United States, but comics were also used in order to reach different audiences, audience that were less keen to read or less prone to read, or were, uh, for example, smaller children, for example, to learn about the life and deed of Martin Luther King. And this method has been used also today. Um, for example, I stumbled upon this uh, propaganda comics for the Lula campaign in Brazil where comics are used to present the message of, um, of Lula present for, uh, for the presidential campaign in, uh, in Brazil. So there's always a sense of politics. Of course, we support the, the, the black movements in the United States and the end of, uh, um, the end of racism and discrimination, but it gets a little bit difficult if the historical comics have a very strong political message that we do not necessarily agree with. For example, I also, uh, these examples of Commando, it's an American comic uh, that is uh, woefully mili militaristic and uh, in order to basically let people sign up for the army. And as, as you can see, Jap killer, they're not very um, elegant and, and friendly in, in terms of uh, political stereotypes. Another one is also the top-down stories from Amachitra in India. It's also like uh, the freedom fighters of Indian glorious nation uh, as they are reflected in comics. I remember in, in one of the early Tintin books is called Tintin in the Land of the Soviets. And this was also made in light of the anti-communism, anti-Soviet um, propaganda from the West. It's funny for you coming from Armenia, Georgia, and Ukraine to, to read it because this book has often in the West been dismissed as trash and kitsch because of the obvious bias by Tintin, uh, since he is depicting the Soviet Union as a very negative place, a dreadful place. But it's interesting to see that there's always this kind of different side and perhaps uh, Tintin wasn't so um, wrong in some of his observation, even though I think also artistically, it's not a very good book. Um, this is the political side, so please keep that in mind when you're writing your historical comics. Um, we have the biographies in comics. There, there is obvious reason that comics writers often choose visual artists to uh, make biography about, for example, Chagall, uh, Vincent van Gogh, uh, Bosch. They are mostly Dutch artists in this case. But um, this is a recurring uh, for, uh, yeah, theme, genre in, um, in graphic biography, graphic novels, where they take a visual artist from the past and make a graphic novel about it. It's an, let's say, easy step and it's easy to do and it makes it also, um, for sure you will have interest in your book because even people who don't know the Barbara Stock who made the biography of Vincent, they know Vincent van Gogh and might be interested in the biography. But let's now move to the more interesting part because all of this history comics uh, are about people just telling other people's story. But it gets interesting when the I enters the story and the I means, well, both this I, but also the uh, first person singular. Because the I person is often the, the subjective observ observant, is participating in the history and is playing with memories, playing with thoughts, playing, playing with history, playing with perspectives on, on how to see history. And this is uh, something that we can learn from a lot, I think. Uh, two examples are Marjan Satrapi, from, um, originally from Iran, but she has been living in France for a long time. And Alexander Zograf, you may not know him because I think he's less popular in your countries. Um, but he's a Serbian writer who is always very, I mean, he's very present in his comics, as you can see. Um, for example, the next example, he travels to Sarajevo. We see him very well here on the right. He's, he's with his hand, with his finger on his chin. So this is the way how he makes comics. He is the center of the universe. He travels to Sarajevo and the way how he sees the Sarajevo is basically his perspective. <laughs> um, 
so the history goes through Zograph, visually, textually, and then we kind of get it served by his own taste and his own um, focus. Um, somewhere in between, I would say, is the work of Joe Sacco, and most of you may know his work. He's a graphic journalist, so to say. He's the well, one of the fathers of graphic journalism, but his work uh, is also a lot about history. Um, he is present in his comics. You can see him on the right, for example, on the right side, right page. You can see him. He has these glasses and uh, next to uh, Karadzic, the, the Bosnian Serbian war criminal, uh, you can see that he's present. So he's walking through the scenes of his comics, but still he's telling other people's story most mostly and, and, and predominantly. So this, when you're planning to write about history in your comics, this is, I think, the first question you need to ask yourself. Is this story that you're going to tell about yourself, not meaning only about yourself, but about your, how you have experienced the history and how you perceive the history, or is it about the history that is not necessarily linked to you? You may think, why is he asking this question? But I believe this is fundamental in the way how you do research. And that's why you came to your laptop or you switched on your laptop today to learn something about how to do research and historical research. Um, so it's really essential before you, I mean, you have some idea about history, you have some idea about a past event or an event from your own life, you want to translate it into comics. And what I always tell my students, because I'm also teaching in, in creative writing, is let's say a history story or like your story has three engines that drive the story forward. One is the history. This means, for example, the history of the war in Ukraine, the history of the Armenian genocide or the history of the well, collapse of the Soviet Union. I, I don't know, a big history. There is a certain idea, it could be an abstract idea, it could also be like an emotional idea, but it's very, it's very universal often, something like revenge or identity or um, um, pity, um, very strong emotions or very strong ideas. And there is the person or the personage or there's the... Uh, protagonist that you focus on. Any story that you write includes all three of them, but this is my message. Um, one of them comes on top. So either it's a story about a certain idea, emotion, let's say, uh, let's put it like revenge, and then the history and the personages are supportive to tell that story. Or it's about a certain person you would want to write about your grandfather, for example. Then the other two aspects, the history and the idea, are supportive of that person's uh, story. Or you focus only on the history. You want to make sure that you have a clear and uh, concise history of an event. I don't know, the Maidan revolution, for example. And you want to focus on the correct depiction of the history. Then the other two elements are supportive of the history. If you choose and when you choose one of these three kind of focal points as the leading focal point, that also means that the way how you do research will be different. If you focus only on, well, on history first, then chronology is important, but also facts. You can't play with facts if you want to explain um, truly how, what happened and why it happened and how it happened, it's, it's important to have the facts correct. However, if you think about the idea, the emotion of a more subjective experience of um, loss or trauma, uh, facts do matter. You can't play with facts, but it's much more important to also find a way to visualize the thoughts. And for persons, uh, to make it interesting, the reader should follow the person, follow the personage. In that sense, you focus on the psychology, the plot, the, the dilemmas of the person. This is what, what moves the story uh, forward.
Well, I can imagine you have some questions about this, but uh, I will get back uh, to it. Because now, and finally, the historical research, I said, um, uh, if you do historical research, there are two times. There are bygone times and our times. Well, I will explain this. Bygone times is all the times uh, that no one can talk about anymore. This is what I call cultural memory or collective memory. For example, the First World War is uh, a history that we all have learned about in the first, uh, in the, I don't know, primary school or secondary school, or you have read books about it, or if you've seen movies about it, but there's no one or, well, probably no one you can talk with that uh, consciously experienced the First World War. And you can even go back to, I don't know, the Civil War, Russian Civil War, something like 100 years ago. Well, maybe you will find some, one or two persons, but not many. Um, and there's a social memory and personal memory. This is history that you can still talk about. And you see on the right of my slide, you can still find persons that experienced the end of the Soviet Union, the, um, the war in, in um, Karabakh, for example, some, some stories that uh, are alive because the people who experience it are still alive. Um, I make a distinction with the, let's say, dead. It's not really dead, but the history of dead persons and the history of living persons. Because if you want to write about the history of dead persons, it's a part of cultural and collective memory. Um, the first and the second and the third focus is look for things, artifacts, images, physical objects. Um, these can be images, this can be photographs, this can be diaries, this can be um, uh, even, even really like clothes, for example. It can be anything, but something that connects us with the past by true things. And that sounds very obvious, but um, mind you, um, in order to destroy the memory of people from the past, this is what totalitarian regimes have done very often. They destroyed the names of people, the uh, heritage of people. They destroyed everything that could connect us to those people who have lived in the dead past. Or other way around, if we want to forget the people from the, the the past. We can also erase the things that do, well, recall those people. Think about the statues of Stalin. This is a picture of 1956 in Hungary. Um, the Hungarians took down the statue of Stalin, not because they wanted to remember him, but they wanted to get rid of the memory of Stalin or the, the, the story of Stalin. So, um, Going back into time, going back to the cultural and collective memory is uh, a physical, uh, uh, tactile, uh, visual journey. And this also means that the research is focused on, on that. However, on the other side, if you want to write about something that is uh, still alive, then it's not so much about the visual and the tactile and the um, physical, it's much more about talking. Get to these people that you want to write about. Do interviews, do conversations, meet them, speak with them. You are there to record their voices, to, to make sure that they uh, belong to the future and all the future of history, so to say. So um, I worked on the First World War a lot. And uh, since I don't know anyone who survived the First World War, I looked at things. Uh, of course, photo databases, I was making collections, uh, documents, um, but it can also help to, for example, visualize and visual research is important. As you can see, this is a book. Um, I have it here. Uh, this is a book about the beginning of the First World War, French. Uh, it's not such a very good book, but I was browsing through it and I saw, uh, based on what I know from Sarajevo, this is about Bosnia, that the authors did a lot of visual research. You can even see, I mean, I can almost remember the postcards that depict these pictures, the ones of the boys walking through the center of Sarajevo, 
I'm quite sure that I've seen a postcard of this. So mm, in order to get to the dead pass, you should do visual research. Why? Because the textual part, you can play around a little bit more. No one will take offense if you just play around with words a little bit of protagonist in the first world tour because they're not here to control it anymore. That doesn't mean you should fake the history, but it's not so important to um, to be accurate in text, but it's important to be accurate in visual representation. So um, my other advice is also to discuss with historians. Even if you're not a historian, you can maybe find one. You have a friend from high school or from um from university you talk with them you tell them i'm working on this could you check whether the clothes are correct did people in that time have this folklore for example these things and it's good to to this is also like the memory to share the memory however and now we get to the living past so to say if we still have access to the living memory of the living past, we should go out, take a microphone and do interviews, talk with the people. And the best example of a historical comic that is entirely based on the voices from the past is, of course, Mouse by Art Spiegelman. And I'm pretty sure that it has been translated into Georgian and Armenian. I don't know about Ukrainian, but probably as well. And um, you all know it probably. If you don't know it, you should go to the library uh, as soon as possible to read it. Um, the story of Maus is Arch Pigelman, his father survived Auschwitz, and Arch Pigelman is basically interviewing his father about the Second World War and the Shoah and um, making a comic out of it. That's it. I mean, I have them here, but well, you can see. That, that he's interviewing his father. There's one thing about the mice, but you probably know about this. Um, I will talk about that later. One thing that I wrote down, beware of the talking heads. If you're writing a historical comic that is about people that you have been doing interviews with, of course, and this is more of a visual aesthetic question than a historical question, um, don't put in hats with balloons, but play with the stories. Um, an example that I would like to share is something from Dutch history. Um, it was super impressive to me. Peter Pontiac is a Dutch comics writer. He was the one who translated Maus into Dutch and also lettered it. Lettering means, I mean, filling the balloons. And he was, uh, it, um, it resulted in a existential crisis because he realized Arch Spiegelman's father was in Auschwitz, but my own father was an SS volunteer at the Eastern Front. So he was on the wrong side of history. And um, actually his father had committed probably suicide by drowning himself in a tropical island somewhere on the Dutch um, West, in I mean, the Caribbean island. Um, so he couldn't talk with his father anymore, but what he did was basically get into the things of his father, the stories, the photographs, uh, and even the drawings, as you can see. Here's the drawings. And he made a graphic novel, which is called Kraut, about the life of his father, but also about SS volunteers, Dutch SS volunteers on the wrong side of history that uh, wanted to fight for the Nazis. Um, what is especially interesting, but that's a side note, that the whole book is handwritten. So it's a letter to his father, but as you can see, it's also um, handwritten. Okay, we have still some time. I will explain a little bit about my own book and how I've done my research. Uh, Attentat is a story about the First World War, the beginning of the First World War, and the assassination of Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo. Um, which sparked the beginning of the First World War. You probably have learned about it in history lessons. And I made it with the Serbian uh, artist Boris Stanic. And you can see our names are both on it. It's Guido van Hengel because this is a Serbian um, book. Um, what, what I did is I provided 
bore us with the research. So I did historical research in, um, well, cityscapes of, uh, of Sarajevo, Bosnian um, history, but mostly also visual. So I was sending constantly photographs to him, but I also invited him because at that time I was living in Sarajevo, I invited him to go with me in Sarajevo and to walk the streets, to smell the city, to experience the city. And this is once again, uh, my belief that I think history only starts to come alive if you can touch it, if you can feel it, if you can smell it, if you can, um, well, get access to it by physical, physical, experience you see the first thing is that i need to drink something after physical um so this is uh, some research that i did for for boris you see that he has been drawing according to photographs but he also took his own um, inspiration and his own style into into the final comic uh, here are photos of the some of the assassins of Franz Ferdinand in in prison. Uh, he made them darker and, uh, and more difficult, um, sinister. Sorry. Um, when we were walking the streets of Sarajevo, we also tried to find out what is our what's the engine of our story, as I talked about before. What drives our story. What is the re reason why we want to tell the story? And actually, we concluded that it's the fear of agency, that you're doing something and that the outcomes are so disastrous that this is, I mean, killing someone is, of course, wrong, but uh, provoking a, a world war, a great war, is not only wrong, but it's also quite, um, uh, quite a un incomprehensible experience. Uh, how um, these uh, terrorists uh, indeed provoked the end of the world, basically. So as you, as you can see, the moment when there's some shooting, we also tried to ca capture um, this feeling that's not only about um, killing, but also about being aware of historical um, change or something. Um, here's some more research. Um, uh, what I liked about uh, Boris' style, he's very expressive. He's more of an expressionist uh, comics writer. Um, but for him, it's still important that things are correct. For example, this is the bed where the murderers of Franz Fernand died in a Czech prison. So it's very um, expressionist, but the bed, he takes inspiration from the, from the photos that I dug up. Uh, I worked a lot with letters. Uh, this is not the same letter as you can see, but um, these letters have been used for the comic a lot. So I transcribed these letters and um, we put them into comics. And uh, for me, it was a, I mean, it sounds a bit cynical, but it was a nice present that I could get access to the police and the judicial files um, of the um, court case against the assassins of Franz Ferdinand because this included a lot of dialogues between police interrogators, as you can see on the left, and on the right, the suspects of the of the assassination. And you can see, and most of you read, uh, all of you read Cyrillic, you can see that I uh, got my hand on the interrogation of Gavrilo Princip, uh, the main assassin himself. This was very useful to use these dialogues in interrogation because as you can see, uh, Boris was using them in the comic directly. You can see Princip said this and the other said that and the police said this. And so he's using those uh, historical documents one to one. Um, a big mistake, well, big, uh, not mistake, a big uh, challenge for us was to visualize the war because war is such a, a uh, ghastly thing and we don't want to delve into kitsch so um uh, we took a lot of inspiration for, for of expressionist paintings uh, georg gross for example to to make war uh, to not literally visualize war but try to make um yeah 
transcend the visuals and in a way that it can still be horrible but not uh not too graphic i mean it is graphic but um this is a challenge and this brings me to my fifth topic for today tragics i always found it horrible to use the word comics in the history of trauma and war because there's nothing comical about the holocaust or about the first world war I don't know. Maybe let's let's introduce the concept of tragics, even though I think um, it doesn't always have to be tragical or tragic. But um, it's important to think about how to visualize trauma and war. This is from Maus. Um, in the Netherlands, there was a huge debate about different comics adaptations of the diary of Anne Frank. Uh, and Frank, the diary of Anne Frank is probably known to most of you. And a lot of people said this is uh, blasphemous because her diary is so important. It's such an important legacy of the Second World War and the Holocaust. And how can people well trivialize it into a, a comic book? It's not for fun. It is a serious story. However, um, even though she's hidden in a... In, uh, in the house in Amsterdam, the, the most horrible part of her story is not in the diary because she's killed in Auschwitz. But of course, there's no um, uh, writings about that because the book ends abruptly. Um, this is different in uh, Marjan Satapi's book about the revolution in Iran. Uh, I guess you also know it. It's also, I saw there was translations also in. Um, Georgia, maybe in other languages as well, definitely in French and English. Um, this is a story of a young girl at the during the revolution in uh, Iran, and she explains the history of the Iranian revolution from a child's perspective. What, what struck me and what I found very beautiful is that she also incorporates this children perspective, even when talking about the most horrendous torture uh, in Iran. For example, this man is cut to pieces, but it's it's done in such a strange comical way that a child doesn't really understand how a person can be cut into pieces. Um, but this makes it even more horrible than because you realize that the child is not able to comprehend what this means, that a person is tortured and cut into pieces. Um, this is a book from, uh, uh, it, uh, I think, French-Italian uh, comics writer. And uh, the Armenians uh, among you will definitely recognize it. I don't know if it's translated into Armenian. I guess it is. Uh, it's about the genocide uh, in the during the First World War. Um, I also was a bit puzzled by the covers because the left one is for me a little bit too much like a comics book. I think the topic is too serious to to show it like this. The design, the middle one, is for me. A bit too aesthetic it's too beautiful in a way and i think it should also be um a story of um it's terribly ugly and ter terrible in many ways so the third one however is a bit too graphic so i i think it's a huge debate to how to depict and how to visualize uh, horror stories from the past and um, i don't have the answer to this but maybe later you can also give your opinion about these three uh, covers. Um, a solution how to show um, the horrors of war is, of course, allegory. And this is something that I worked on with um, dogs, uh, try to explain the wars in Yugoslavia by focusing on public space and on dogs. But I work with real dogs, real stray and street dogs. Uh, mouse is an allegory where the mice and the cats and the dogs and the pigs are all um, basically masks masks that kind of make the story somehow digestible even though it's it is not i like this one a, a lot because the mask is uh, just a trick but if you take away the, the mask there's not a human to be found but the skull so this is also um it opens up a lot of questions how to uh, visualize these horrors and um, one of the best part of miles is you see the um, author on a pile of dead mice bodies um, 
it's about Auschwitz, but he's discussing his own work within the work. So it opens up more questions about what um, what this means to him and to us, to the readers. This is um, also something related with dogs that have been killed by traffic, but as a symbol for what happened in Bosnia, it's by a Swedish uh, artist, Max Anderson. And the book is called Bosnian Flat Dog. Just got in my mind. Um, this is an example I would like to share with you because this is very interesting and maybe also some food for thoughts for all of you. Um, this is a comic book by Raymond Briggs about the Falkland Wars in the 1980s where uh, Great Britain and Argentina had a fierce fight about the stupid little island, the Fal well, Falkland Islands. And uh, it's for children, actually. And a lot of the comic is uh, drawn in this kind of, let's say, comical style, funny, big bang bong. And it's like, what? bang, 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 yeah. went the guns of the tin pot foreign gen general. It's, it's like a children book about wars, but... What I found very strong and also very moving is that when really the victims are falling and when the casualties occur, then he changes style. So the funny part is about the, the fights, but the real killings are in a totally different style within the book. Some men were shot, some were drowned, some men were burned alive, some men were blown to bits. Hundreds of brave men were killed and they were all real men made of flesh and blood. They were not made of tin of, or of iron. So you see the distinction between the politicians fighting and the people dying in, in the visualization of the comics. This is a very elegant way to make uh, history tangible without um, delving into kitsch. Um, so uh, I talked for about 45 minutes. Uh, this is something I wanted to do with you as some kind of exercise, but let's let's just um, consider it homework. <laughs> um, you have a story to tell, definitely. You have a story to tell. This is something that you've re read in the news, something you have been uh, thinking about, something you learned from your parents or grandparents, or something you would like to share yourself. Um, Try to discuss with friends or colleagues what does your story mean to you and what drives your story forward. And then get back to my slide that I showed a couple of, um, let's say, 30 minutes ago. Is it you would like to tell the history? Is it a certain feeling you would like to get across, an abstract concept? Or is it a certain person you would like to follow, a protagonist that is important and that we need to understand? It can be a politician, a military person, or it can be your grandmother. Um, this is essential because it helps you to do research. It helps you to construct your story. It helps you to um, explain what you're doing and it helps you to visualize it. So um, this is very important. Um, the person, by the way, doesn't have to be human. It can be a non-human per personage. Uh, and I would like to recall the work of Majan Kabash. He's a comics writer from Lebanon. And he wrote this very moving comic. It's called Letters to the Mother. And um, he says, mother died today. And it's about uh, Beirut, in fact. So he, he makes Beirut the main character of his comic in the... Um, in well, transformed or even shape shifted into his mother. So the text is about the mother, but the visuals is about well, um, bombed buildings in in Beirut. So the person doesn't have to be a real person, but it is a focal point that you would like to um, to put to the front, put to the fore. Um. This is something, this is more of an advice, a tip uh, on Libere Co. Libere Co is, um, is a partnership for human rights. I found this interesting um, series of sketchy comics about uh, Ukraine. Uh, you should definitely check them out. They're also in Ukrainian. 
um, and there are short stories in comic format about um, the the ongoing wars in uh, in, in Ukraine. Something to um, to have a look at for the Ukrainians among you, but also for the non-Ukrainians among you. So this is my lecture and webinar. Uh, I took 45 minutes more or less. It has been recorded. Um, what I will do is now to stop sharing my screen, uh, but I hope that there will be some uh, questions or reflections or uh, suggestions or critique. Um, so please, uh, please go ahead. I think uh, Ari, they will write down or something. Uh, yes, there are no questions at this moment, but I will invite everybody now to write their questions if you have some. And meanwhile, let me ask you a question which is also very much connected to our project. Mm -hmm. So I don't know about um, Georgia or Ukraine, but from my own experience here in Armenia, when you talk about comics, you usually mean something really funny, mm -hmm. something for kids. You have an idea of uh, more a Marvel comics rather than all these types of comics that you and our other international trainers have been talking about. Mm -hmm. And this is indeed amazing because it appears that all these world important and world famous uh, comic books are not funny at all. Mm -hmm. They are all about tragedies. They are all based on some history facts and tragic history facts eventually. You know, the mouse and the Persepolis and uh, some others or some personal tragedies. And um, this is very interesting. I think that we need to kind of market this correctly in our region where mm -hmm. maybe also in Georgia is the same and Ukraine that people think comics are just, you know, funny picture books. Mm -hmm. uh, but they are eventually a more effective way of uh, giving a message of about you know tragedies, about wars, about you know victims or some psychological uh, problem. Mm -hmm. So this is just a commentary, a very interesting one that I was thinking about. Um, uh, so the other thing I wanted to say is that um, these comic books that will be created in the frames of our project. Mm -hmm. should be based on real facts mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Of course, it will be based on real facts because it's about war, existing wars, not not some, you know, not a um, fictitious one. And we have uh, asked our writers, project writers, to do interviews, to mm -hmm. collect materials, just as you were suggesting and, you know, recommending. They need to interview people who witnessed war. They need to pick some real life stories about, you know, how women have been affected and are being affected in this mm -hmm. uh, wars, in these situations. So, uh, yeah, so I think this will be very helpful for them also to uh, hear this. Um, yeah, so the, the, we... Considering interviews, I think um, what is really important is to take the time as well. Because uh, I think uh, Mouse by Archpigon, of course, it's his father, so they're meeting anyway. You, you, even if they didn't talk about the history, he would meet his father. But I think it took him years to to kind of get into the subject. Of course, you don't have the time to talk for years with the interviewees, but um, it's important to take time because history hurts and it's difficult to just scribble down some some notes and then start working so it's also important to spend the time and the process once again as i said the process of drawing and the process of sharing stories and uh, socially um, interacting true stories is as much as important as the output of the project yeah that's clear we've got one question so uh, do European authors and publishers integrate comics into school history textbooks? Do you have any information about that? Mm -hmm. um, well, I remember I showed this history comics in the Netherlands. They were used by history teachers in the Netherlands. So this is something that worked, but that was all, only because it's kind of funny, let's say, funny to um, to learn about history. Um, I think some of these Holocaust comics, especially Mouse, 
they have been used also to starting debates in in schools yeah to start debates about the history but also about how to cope with history so um this is something that is not canonical it's not something that has been used always and it's not like pushed by authorities and what i when i'm talking about the netherlands but it's something that in uh, particular domains uh, has been used indeed and it opens up the discussion because it opens up very important discussion not only what happened but also how we must remember what happened and here there are a lot of different voices some say uh, we should not make comics about it but even that is already interesting to talk about it that things cannot be visualized or it's too hurtful or it's too um serious to make fun of and can we make fun so these are all philosophical questions that can help people to cope with uh, troubled past in one way or another and as you mentioned for example this example of sarajevo uh, comics the book about sarajevo and the other historical ones they also give so much visual information about the time mm -hmm. uh, yeah. that you cannot really give in a text yes so it really helps to give a better visual like like a film but Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Thank you. The the question was from Lasha Berraria. And now we have another question from Luca Lashki, who is, by the way, uh, the um, visual artist from Georgia who was selected to be a part of the project. And he will be paired by Yekaterine Dogonidze, who is the writer from Georgia. Mm -hmm. So his question is, so, hello, my question would be, when you work on a comics about war and conflicts, there is always a chance for it to start looking like a propaganda piece. How mm -hmm. can we avoid bias when we work on a story and make it more personal? Um, yeah. Um... Propaganda is always bad in a way, of course, but um, when you're writing uh, a story about war, I think uh, the most important that it's genuine and authentic. Um, so if you if you are completely obsessed with being, for example, uh, political correct or trying to to have this both sideism or something like uh, we all uh, are wrong somehow, I don't think uh, this is very helpful. So. Um, authentic bias is not necessarily a problem. That would be my suggest suggestion. Uh, it's possible to make a comic that is perhaps a little bit one-sided, but don't make it uh, as if it's a political propaganda. But bias is not a problem. I don't think that comics become uh, will be very authentic if you try to get rid of all bias, because then it's going to be like uh, tasteless. So it's not a problem if you have bias and if you feel strong emotions about the other or about certain political events um don't be afraid of it but it's important to be authentic in a way and not speak in propaganda language or parrot propaganda language yeah. uh there are no more questions and i think we're gonna close up here thank it's you evening very already much. right in it is it is evening here yes it's uh it, it's over eight it's eight ten so okay uh yeah thank you um, for listening uh everyone thank you guido and hope to be in contact with you thank you yes. very much thank you thank you